All right, well, welcome back, everybody. I'm glad I stole you away from the coffee and the cakes. I'm sure this is hopefully going to be a little bit interesting for you. We've obviously had a really interesting morning where we've heard a lot from the mobile operator side of things around what they're doing to try and prepare themselves around security uh, and ensure that their networks are secure and then starting to think about how they can deliver products and services that can be used by the by the other vertical industries. Uh, I particularly liked the example that was given by Vodafone around how they were using the capabilities of the mobile network to be able to reduce fraud and protect their customers and obviously the bank's customers from um, the fraud that they were facing. So very much now we're trying to take the lens and hear from our customers around um, what it is that they need. So obviously mobile operator strategies are evolving. They're looking for innovation into new areas where they can start to develop new revenues beyond core. And that is a strategy that we're seeing become widespread across the industry. And we're seeing more and more operators move into that space. And the results are now starting to become quite significant. Back in 2017, around 17% of mobile operators' revenue came from beyond core, so beyond our traditional telco business. We continue to see that grow, and it's now reached 24% in a recent study from GSMAI. So for us to be able to continue to see that growth, and we obviously need that growth within the industry to be able to continue, us, um, continue to develop and move forward, we need to really understand our customers. So over probably the next hour or so, I'm really pleased to say that we're going to hear from four different verticals, understand what their needs are, understand what they're doing already around security and beyond that, and then obviously what their requirements are in the future. Um, we'll have MasterCard, we'll have Entity Docomo giving a representation from the manufacturing side of things. We'll have Airbus um, telling us their story around what they're doing and how they're using mobile technology. And then we'll have IBM, who've recently carried out a piece of work with Jaguar Land Rover and China Mobile to understand the needs and the future needs around connectivity for the connected car. So with all of that said, the way the session is going to work is I'll invite my panelists to come up one by one. They'll share a brief presentation around what they're doing in this space around um, uh, their businesses and share with you some of their thoughts. And then we'll run along those four presentations and then I'll invite the members or the presenters back up for a short panel where we can ask them a few questions and really get into the nitty gritty detail of what's been going on. So with that said, I would like to introduce uh, Steve from MasterCard to come up and share the MasterCard view. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Brown, uh, Vice President, MasterCard Cybersecurity and Resilience. You might wonder what I'm doing here. Uh, you know, MasterCard at a telco security conference, and it's not just convenience as we're based on the 7th, 8th, and 9th floor of this very building. Um, so, MasterCard for us, we're in a, a unique position. We sit within the security realm as a potential victim and as a potential vendor solution and allegedly thought leader. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you today. Uh, Jeremy from Huawei mentioned it very early on about the opportunities that are there for each and every organization, each and every sector, none more so than in the, the financial sector which we primarily operate in. But with great opportunity for us as consumers and us, us as organizations comes great risk. And particularly where security is not at the heart of every move that we make. That's very fancy. I didn't put that together. Um, for MasterCard, though, it's about going beyond the credit card space. And you'd all be forgiven for thinking that's where MasterCard operates. And of course, that is part of our core business. But now it's about addressing those risks to our customers and indeed to ourselves as an organization. It's about utilizing that unique lens that we have. So seeing every transaction that takes place between issuing banks, acquiring banks, merchants, telcos, airlines, governments, whoever that may be, gathering the threat intelligence from each of those transactions and utilizing that to identify, to prioritize, and to mitigate the risks that we see. Again, not only to our enterprise, but then taking that learning and using it to inform the assessments that we carry out. The four areas of risk on these really fancy circles here are the areas that we are focusing upon, or certainly my department and, and, um, and my team. 
First and foremost, it's about the digital risk that's created to ourselves, ourselves as consumers and again ourselves as organisations. So how can we verify the identity of our consumers? How can we look at how our customers are utilising our services and enable ourselves to be able to authorise and authenticate that they are the right people? Once we've done that, we actually have a, a duty then, certainly as MasterCard, as an enabler of digital commerce, a duty then to help secure digital commerce. And we do that through identity verification and more. Moving into the next uh, risk category, it's financial. And again, this is sort of the, the meat and drink of MasterCard's business over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Of course, in fiat currency, we have plenty of technologies to best identify money laundering practices, prevent fraud. But now as we move into a new world of crypto currency, we've, uh, we're developing and acquiring new technologies, such as our recent acquisition of CypherTrace, to identify risk in every crypto transaction and better inform the issuing banks, the acquiring banks and the merchants whether there is risk associated to that crypto payment. So is it Steve Brown who's legitimately got a load of Bitcoin? I wish. Um, or is it Steve Brown who's a cyber criminal and that Bitcoin has been derived following a ransomware attack on a hospital? And again, providing that element of risk to our customers. Cyber. Um, my career has been uh, prior to MasterCard with the National Crime Agency and National Cyber Crime Unit. So investigating cyber criminals, organized crime groups, nation states. And we now see, everybody in this room knows, and we've heard already from, uh, from the likes of Vodafone, about the cyber threat that exists. It's no longer, you know, the, the kid in the hoodie in the basement. This is organized crime, this is nation states, and these are really sophisticated and educated people who are going about and making it their day-to-day -day business to disrupt us and to undermine the integrity, the confidentiality and the availability of our data. And MasterCard, again, in our, in our recent history, acquired a number of technologies such as Risk Recon and developed that to be able to identify the vulnerabilities, to prioritize them, see where they're around your most critical and vulnerable assets, and then about mitigation. And again, using that intelligence that we've got to be able to try and drive resilience within the ecosystem. And then finally, it's recognizing that today it's going beyond the cyber realm. There are other elements of risk that are associated to our business and certainly associated to our supply chains, whether that be the geopolitical impact of you know, political uprising or the Russian reinvasion of, uh, of Ukraine last year and what um, impact that has upon your organization, on your supply chain, or whether it's your um, ability to conform to ESG. You know, certainly ourselves at MasterCard, our Priceless Planet Coalition, our drive for a sustainable planet, that's absolutely critical to us as an organization. But if we find out that one of our suppliers or our supplier suppliers are burning down the rainforest or employing forced labor, that is contrary to everything that we as an organization believe in, we need to know about that and we need to be able to mitigate that risk to our business. So we've been doing some work with, with ITA recently um, and, and from our own perspective. So MasterCard, we have 10,000 plus suppliers and that's not including every customer, every bank, every uh, organization throughout the world that we work with. And we've seen the increase in vendor risk. Everybody or most people in this room will be no stranger to the likes of you know, the SolarWinds, Kaseya, recently the Move It ransomware attack and the impact that that's having on vendors and vendors inability to be able to, or most vendors inability to be able to really be more resilient to a cyber attack. And cyber criminals know that, that's why they're not focusing at as much at our main enterprises, they're focusing at our supply chain. And the impact that that has on hundreds if not thousands of victims allows them a, a position of power to be able to demand greater ransoms to be able to cause greater disruption. As long as the increased uh, vendor risk, we've got the increase of complexity and, and somebody mentioned it earlier about it's a truly hyper-connected world and the globalization of the services we rely on, whether that's IT services, cloud services, mobile network services and more, bring about great opportunity. But again, where we lack that due diligence to be able to, to, uh, to look at those service providers in, in a sort of forensic level detail, we lose or we start to lose control. So from a MasterCard perspective, it's about taking back that control, allowing us to be able to assess those third parties, that supply chain, and again, inform you of the risk and how to mitigate it. And then finally, it's about the broader risk dimensions. I just mentioned about maybe ESG and geopolitical, but going beyond the cyber realm, the impact of uh, the number of sanctions we're seeing, certainly by the Western world against Russian and Belarusian entities. 
whilst you might feel you've got a good handle on your supply chain, what about your supplier suppliers and their suppliers? Have they been impacted by the, the sanctions? Has one of their directors been, uh, had the finger pointed at them? We need to know, or you need to know, to be able to mitigate that risk and that potential reputational harm to your business. And again, this is what MasterCard are doing. Um, my colleagues, my team are based out there. Just before I forget, we do have a booth and we'll take you through some of the capabilities that we're using ourselves to be able to, to monitor and to assess that risk of our supply chain and certainly how we can help you and your organizations do the same. But to do that, it's about working with the likes of yourselves and finding out what are the biggest pain points within the security industry at the moment. And certainly supply chain and, and the, the resource intensivity that that brings about is critical to how we now want to be able to drive efficiencies throughout our businesses. So the time consumption, the, the sort of archaic methods of questionnaires and Excel spreadsheets and more, and the great burden that brings on our security teams, we need to be able to drive forward into a more automated and an integrated fashion. As a former detective and investigator, I'd never want to take the human element out of that. So we as businesses and organizations have to be able to ensure that we are informing that automation. So what are your risk tolerance levels? What's your budget? What's your capability? What is your risk appetite to know what your suppliers and your suppliers' suppliers are doing? And again, this is the, the drive that MasterCard certainly are trying to bring about through relationship building and generating trust throughout the ecosystem. Someone mentioned before about, you know, there's certainly been three and a half thousand different cybersecurity vendors at least, and I think 3,000 of those were at InfoSec and Excel the other week. It's, a, it's an assault on the senses when you go to events like that, and you, you know, everyone's shouting about AI and ML and zero trust. Very few of them actually do it. But actually, it's about what you want from your business, what you want from that engagement with that vendor, how it marries up to what you already might have in-house, and again, what you can drive forward to have more robust automation and integrate it into your security operations center or to your chief risk officer so that they're able to see things through that single pane of glass. I've talked before already about a number of the different cyber attacks. We've seen a lot in the news recently, the likes of the BBC, British Airways, Boots. Uh, I've had the finger pointed. You know, cyber security and security as a whole is not about finger pointing. It's about collaboration. It's about working with those entities to find out the practices that they're using and to try and lift all boats in that harbor. Because when we do that, we are, as an organization, as an enterprise, as an ecosystem, more resilient, and we make life for cyber criminals and certainly now nation states more difficult to operate. So this is where we're trying to drive to, not only as MasterCard and in our ecosystem, but actually how we work with you all in this room. It's that ability to map your entire network, not just of your immediate suppliers, but be able to know about the sub-tier relationships that you have, or that you know you have, or more importantly, or sometimes as importantly, that you don't know you have. Expanding that risk profile, so again, looking for other areas that you can uh, attribute risk to, but also that you can mitigate. We're very much about being an evidence-based organization, so it's no good me telling you whether you're good or bad or indifferent at cybersecurity or your ESG score is low. What does that actually mean? And my colleague Ria, she's flown all the way from Frankfurt to speak to you all today, so please indulge her and go to the booth and find out how we do that. It's about casting a wider net, so not just relying on your own capabilities that you've got in-house, but looking at other data sources. And our partnership with Interos allows us to be able to bring in that data to be able to conform it to your standards, your compliance frameworks. And now we're seeing certainly the legislative impact of supply chain uh, breaches. We've got the Digital Operational Resilience Act for financial institutions. We've now got... Um, equivalency really through NIST 2, so looking at critical national infrastructure and how we all manage our supply chain. I've seen recently the, the German Digital Supply Chain Act uh, and Due Diligence Act that's coming in, and we've seen, of course, here the Prudential Regulation Authority from the Bank of England. All of these are pointing towards our need to be able to, rather than nice to, it's about need to be able to manage that supply chain. And then if you're going to do that and you're going to conform to all these regulations, you certainly need to be able to automate. And that's what we're doing now, continuously monitoring that process. Those are my details. I think my 10 minutes are up. I'll be on the panel, but certainly around and at the booth later on. So thank you very much. Okay, so 
Just moving on from the finance sector, I'd like to invite Malia up from, um, to give us a perspective of what's happening around Industry 4.0 and within manufacturing. Yep. Over to you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, so from uh, money session we hear from operator side, so we thought that it will be better to bring from uh, vertical industries what they're thinking from security side. So we are. He I'm here from uh, uh, represent 5G ACIA. It's an alliance group uh, mainly for communication automation and, and uh, for our automation industries. So just to give on this one. So this alliance, the main objective of this alliance to bring these OT industries uh, mainly from uh, automation industries and manufacturing industries and ICT industries together to make it uh, shaping the 5G network into uh, industry domain. So talking uh, main common language and identifying the requirements which could be developed into 5G architecture, for instance. So we are around more than 100 partners from OT industries as well as from the ICT industries together. Uh, we develop different uh, architecture requirements, security requirements, and we have periodic meetings on this one. As in addition to that, we will also have a collaboration with different uh, partners, associations, and GSMA is one of them. We often exchange the liaisons and to derive the requirements into the standard specification. So uh, from the security side in working group three, we developed a white paper which will summarize the main requirement from industries and identify the gaps uh, required in the mobile network and provided because if you look at a mobile operator network, there are the different uh, world. For instance, their, ma their go main goal was developed to do, uh, derive the communication service to the end user, but from the IT, uh, for OT industry's perspective, there are different requirements. So somehow we need one platform to, to, to together, uh, bring together to discuss the security requirements, address them. So here this white paper is published. I just give some overview of this couple of slides about the main requirements from security side uh, from industry perspective. So uh, typically, these are the basic uh, fundamental uh, security characteristics of OT networks. So when we talk about the OT networks, uh, from security side, they are physically isolated. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, mainly because of this mitigating the cyber attacks, uh, because this is the critical network. If there is any uh, impact on the OT, uh, this uh, isolated network, then it has significant impact on the whole uh, shutdown in the manufacturing industry. So there is a big revenue impact. To avoid that one, so typically, uh, uh, process is that to have physical isolation. This is a uh, typical they use in the OT industries and the strict uh, parameter uh, access control. So, so that everything, whenever they go, even uh, for OT uh, automation uh, integrated partners also cannot enter uh, without any proper reasoning. So that is also there. And even every flow and every data, whatever the exchange, it's more confidential protection, integrity protection need to be done. And if when 5G was uh, mainly going into the IT in the OT industries, uh, then this physical sense to jamming is one of the critical aspects uh, which need to be uh, addressed. This is not something which happened in the past, but 5G, when the 5G is coming, when more, more wireless communication happening, this sense to activity about the physical uh, jamming need to be uh, one of the requirements from the security side. And from when, you, when it comes to the uh, security compared to the traditional uh, 5G system, so here you have a single, uh, within the parameter you have a single domain user. The main reason for of this, uh, because of this isolation, there is not much uh, strong uh, authentication mechanisms that they use uh, in, in compared to the tele uh, teleco industries. And even uh, they have an, uh, uh, no need to know principle. So whatever is happening in the industries or whatever the change has taken place, and there is a strict regulation from uh, industry aspects also. So they have to know everything, what is going on, what is the access is provided, and which kind of access is provided. And interesting part of this one, this trust domain and mobile operator is not part of this trust domain. 
So because of that, they have, they need, if they use the 5G network, of course, they have more end-to-end -end communication encryption, uh, encryption need to be provided. So they have to like, take the extra layer of security if they use this 5G uh, based, especially provided by the mobile operator network, uh, not uh, standalone systems. Because of within the parameter uh, concept, uh, they, have, uh, they don't have much of strong authentication mechanisms, they use it. Uh, when you look at the uh, mobile system, you have a strong uh, SIM-based and uh, tamper-proof uh, concept. You have all dedicated hardware, but this is, this is completely different comes to the industry, so they don't have more strong uh, uh, authentication mechanisms. And when we discuss with the industries also, they are, want to have these strong authentication mechanisms, but they have different kind of, different kind of challenges to maintain this identity. A, a, uh, identities in the industry, so they have different kind of challenges they are facing it. So, uh, in, as part of the 5G a, a ACIA, we developed different, uh, considering the different requirements, because if you look at the requirements, they're, they're not fit for uh, one uh, mobile network. So, they, because of that, we have different uh, options are developed in the 5G ACIA. Uh, one is the standalone NPN. So the whole, the concept of this standalone NPN was to have dedicated 5G system, which is run inside the production or manufacturing unit, and there will be no data exchange over the mobile network. There, of course, there uh, in 3GPP also we have different authentication mechanisms like 5G ECA, EPA, ECA Prime. So this kind of flexibility is provided in the 3GPP system to have different authentication mechanisms. So where the SMPN really fit into that so that you have some kind of flexibility based on the industry needs. You can, fit, you can identify what kind of authentication, what kind of security can be played. Uh, of course, having maintaining a standalone NPN is, of course, it will be more cost and you need to get a dedicated spectrum. So before, uh, because of that, we also considered two different concepts of uh, NPN. This is like a public uh, network providing a dedicated service to the industries where you have a concept of having a data is not flowing over the network, but you can store data within the local network, which is the option. Uh, in the middle of the architecture so that you place the user plane within the industry so that you will not expose the data over the mobile network. Uh, and another option you have this NPN as a service. This is, uh, you will go, you have a dedicated uh, spectrum allocated within the industries, but the whole management and all the data process happens over the mobile network. So these are the different concepts uh, developed in that part of the 5G ACIA. So it depends on the business needs and the requirements and the security requirements. You have some kind of flexibility. You will take it into options, whichever the options fits into your business. So to, to summarize a bit, so, so far uh, 5G ACIA developed very good and they had to bring both industries together and provided strong requirements, and most of them are already in the standards developed in 3GPP architecture as well, and developed different security requirements. Of course, there are some aspects need to be uh, improved, especially uh, the often the complaints from the industries that the implementation guidance and the monitoring mechanisms and evidence of incidents if there is any security attack. So this kind of often, we hear this one, this need to be improved, uh, but it's a, obvious it's a process is continuing and more advanced uh, jamming mechanisms uh, to mitigate whatever the jamming, the physical ever, physical ever aspects, if there is a, some issues need to be there. Because in the industry perspective, there are more uh, impact and especially depends on the what kind of industry you are talking about but uh, there is a big impact on the manufacturing if there is a shutdown should, should don't happen due to the some uh, cyber attacks so they are more concerned of that kind of things so it needs to be done uh, so uh, just to summarize so 5g asia is a one platform so we will welcome all the members who are interested to join and as well as there is a website for it please feel free to join. And if you have some specific question related to industry, I'm happy to do it. My team is working very closely with 5G Asia, very active members uh, on this uh, 5G ACIA. So I'm very happy to answer any questions related to industries. And thanks.
you know, amazing to see how far mobile technologies are moving into the um, manufacturing sector. Now we move away from a fixed place, maybe, and maybe up a little bit into the sky. So I'd like to welcome Hakeem from Airbus to uh, tell us, share with us their needs. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm a telecom expert at uh, Airbus for digital aviation. Um, I'm also co-chairing the GSMA uh, Digital Industries Forum um, with the, my colleagues here present. I will give you a brief presentation where 5G has an impact today in our global, say, Airbus-wide ecosystem and also show you a little bit of where the uh, security uh, pain points are and where, where we need to focus. So I've, I've stolen this slide from my other colleagues. <laughs> so we, we basically did um, a market study within our 5G strategy group in Airbus um, two years ago. Uh, the idea is to, to look at where um, 5G or connectivity, generally speaking, um, or cellular connectivity has an impact uh, on uh, Airbus products and verticals in, the, in, in general. Of course, there's manufacturing. This is where I am. Uh, this is my, uh, let's say, um, masterpiece. Um, there's also in-flight entertainment or passenger connectivity, uh, IoT in cabin. and. Uh, Something that is gaining a lot of uh, uh, momentum is the 5G uh, non-terrestrial networks, uh, 5G NTN, that are being defined, and a lot of uh, efforts are being put by my colleagues from uh, Airbus Defense and Space into um, defining the new standard for satellite 5G, um, and also working on the challenges to onboard, uh, you know, to physically uh, redesign the satellite to onboard uh, a, a 5G capable satellite in, uh, in terms of, um, you know, putting a radio base station in the sky, basically. So we have also aircraft operations, MRO, maintenance in airports or other um, uh, uh, maintenance facilities. All of this uh, is where we think uh, we've got uh, a lot of impact and today um, you know um, I haven't touched on uh, unmanned traffic management for example also a big stream at Airbus um, there is some predictions that there is a factor 100 of flying objects in within the next 10 years with unmanned and drones and EV tow and, and, and things like that that means that there is a big challenge on the how we manage all this traffic uh, in uh, you know urban areas, metropolitan areas, close to airports. Um, we think that 5G and uh, hyperconnectivity will play a, a, a major role in, in in this. Of course, we have aircraft uh, connectivity, so we already provide uh, aircraft connectivity platforms for predictive maintenance and so forth that will connect and use this. Um, telco capabilities today uh, with M MVNO contracts that we have globally uh, to offload the data once the airplanes are landed in airports. We, th we, we think that 5G will bring you know, other performances to this, other capabilities that we are addressing uh, uh, now. What it means also is that we need to think of how we design the airplanes really. Um, and uh, you know, putting a new 5G antenna Recertifying the whole uh, airplane is, is a challenge in itself. Of course, we have air to ground connectivity is also a, another stream in, in, uh, in cellular type connectivity. Um, use cases in airports, so that's combined between the airplane at a gate and all the, you know, the, the, the operations that happen at the gate uh, during the the, the, the landing and the, uh, um, the, the, the aircraft being at the gate, basically, where you, you, you want to you know, uh, lower the time it stays at the gate. Uh, so this is what is the live TAT or live turnaround time optimization. So we use a lot of IoT around the airplane. Uh, typically, uh, camera vision is used uh, to, to, to gather insight in when the, you know, how, how the operations happen uh, around the airplane. Um, so, 
that, that is really to set the scene. Uh, um, wh what we think uh, for Airbus, the different market segments where we have an impact with connectivity. Another slide that I uh, this time stolen from my cybersecurity teams. <laughs> um, and very uh, insightful because I think it, it's not going to be a surprise for anybody here, but uh, um, what, what are the risks for Airbus uh, when talking about cyber? You know, data exfiltration, if somebody, you know, hacks into your network and is able to s steal your IP, uh, your uh, intellectual property, that is a big risk, in fact. Um, impact on the industrial uh, continuity means uh, if a production line has stopped, you cannot produce a new, new parts, and all the uh, uh, aircraft, um, you know, uh, production rates are decreasing, and this is uh, a huge problem uh, if, 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 if you think about it. Um, the same applies to your supply chain. I think Steve has touched a lot about supply chain uh, um, <laughs> risks. Uh, so Airbus uses um, a very uh, complex supply chain, as you can imagine, uh, and. We, 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 we need also to think on how to protect the supply chain, basically speaking. Um, what happens if we are unable to protect, uh, to pro sorry, to produce or to, to deliver our services? Uh, we operate satellites for a military, uh, for UK military typically. Uh, we operate, uh, you know, um, uh, secure uh, communications or secure land communications in, in some airports uh, internationally. So that, that, that is where we, we also have a, a big risk. And also related to the previous one, health and safety. Um, that's uh, what happens if the shop floor has stopped, if somebody has uh, taken control of your machines, is there a risk on, on the personnel uh, working in, 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 in that space? Um, so uh, very quickly, what, what type of, um, controls, let's say, by domain that exists today and that we need to uh, implement. Um, to me, there is, first of all, understand um, what threats, identify what threats your company could be under. But risk assessment is, is, is very important. Uh, so we, we discussed on the data uh, leakage. Um, so we, we know that today we have uh, data loss uh, prevention tools that uh, Airbus uses. Um, access control is another domain as well. I mean, today we talked about zero trust, but you know, how do you apply zero trust? Um, for Airbus is that we, you don't trust anything, but you have to also use Airbus identity whenever you connect to an Airbus uh, uh, network. Be it a telco provided network, you still has, have to use an Airbus identity. So multi-factor authentication, of course, with uh, uh, using an Airbus identity is what is uh, uh, hidden uh, here. Communication interception. Uh, today, we don't trust anything. So if a data has to go over a telco network, it has to be encrypted end to end. Um, and even if it's encrypted, you have to classify the, you know, the, the type of uh, or rate your sensitivity level. Some of the data that you have will never cross uh, an outside network. Um, so, uh, with, I mean, this is really like generic kind of um, uh, statements, uh, to, be, to be fair. But when you come to uh, specifics uh, for, for, for Airbus, um, you know, we talk about um, micro-segmentation a, a lot, and I know I have some of the telco partners uh, being present here, so, so for them to understand how much this is important for, for us. Today, we micro-segment everything. So we have domain segmentation, say, uh, manufacturing, for example, is one domain, uh, industrial is another domain, uh, um, digital workbase is a domain, um, aircraft is a domain, and within each of these domains that are completely segregated be uh, um, um, between each other, you have to segment inside the domain. Uh, so typically, as a, um, one example, uh, when you talk about manufacturing, you'll have different kind of assets, of course. Uh, some assets will be used for uh, augmented worker, typically for you know, industrial IoT kind of assets. But for this, 
you have to create a completely segregated path in your network, so an overlay with specific controls adapted to the, the, this type of devices. Um, when we talk about machines, we talk about industrial OT. Um, there is more and more OT and IT convergence, of course, and this is needed. But you need to restrict the areas of communication between different components in your OT environment. And as an example, we have today uh, more or less 500, if not more, uh, what we call enclaves, so very little um, communication um, groups where only a few machines can communicate between each other and nothing else. And then you have different layers of, again, uh, um, um, security adapted to this micro-segmentation world. So if you think back, you need to segment, you need to split things per domain within the domain and then apply the right set of controls to what happens inside that specific domain. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about time here, but um, um, just, just, just to finish and, and maybe give back uh, to, um, to my other colleagues here, um, I think that boundary protection is not enough anymore. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we need to address uh, all the points that I discussed here uh, with the telcos, of course. We do use a lot of telco technologies in our uh, company um, and happy to be uh, to discuss uh, this uh, with you today. Thank you very much. So we heard from Airbus. So I'm now going to bring ourselves back down to earth and um, maybe hear a little bit around the automotive side of things with some work that Laurie's been doing with IBM, uh, JLR and a number of other parties. Welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Can you hear me? Um, hi everyone, my name is Laurie Thorpe. I am the director of the portfolio for IBM in Telco. Um, my background is in IoT, so I've had the, uh, the privilege of working across many other industries as part of the work that I've done, both from a 5G perspective, connectivity, and, and data. Um, I'm, I'm here to present um, some work that, that we've done within IBM uh, with my colleagues. So my colleague Priya, who's here in the audience, who's been leading this for the Institute of Business Value within IBM. Um, we have uh, put together a report that is, we believe is a more balanced view than maybe some of the things that, that have, have been circulating because we've tried to look at the different points of view of the different stakeholders um, when it comes to looking at automotive and connected cars. So this is an area that has been quite controversial because if you look at 5G and the way that 5G has been developed, there's, there's, been, there's a lot of promise around what 5G is going to be able to deliver from a digital economy perspective, from sort of social value perspective. But then when you start to look at the different industries, you start to realize that actually realizing that value um, is, is sometimes a little bit more difficult than, than first expected. Um, so here we've started to look at who are the different stakeholders, what are the points of view of the different stakeholders, and actually what is it going to take to be able to, um, to really realize that, that full potential. Um, and we are, so I will, I will skip this because I think everybody knows what, what a connected vehicle is. Um, but there are probably two aspects that I wanted to highlight. So one is data. So when we think about connected cars and when we think about, auto, um, at about, uh, about the future of automotive, it's actually bigger than just connecting a car because ultimately the cars are going to be talking to a lot of other things. So it expands into uh, connected cities, it's, it expands into smart cities, it expands into how you interact with your vehicle, with the, uh, how you interact with, you know, at the point of sales, all of these other things. So actually it, it goes beyond just the vehicle being connected. And really it's about data. 
Um, the other part is around the connectivity, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Going back to the data, um, so here we're, we're here to talk about security. And when we talk about data, actually, we need to be looking at, you know, it's not just data. It's, it's about trusted data. It's about whether you can rely on that data, uh, whether you know who it is that is sending that data, whether you can, you can really trust it. And I think the point here is that if that data can't be trusted, then you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. None of, none of the, the ecosystem really works. Um, so exchanging data between, whether it's between cars or whether it's between um, cars and the road infrastructure, it really comes, or whether it's between the car and the car manufacturer. So for example, when we are uh, downloading uh, a software upgrade to, to our car, we need to be really thinking about, you know, can I trust this and can it be compromised? And what is the consequence of something like that being compromised? And we can see that actually the, the consequence can be, you know, they can be quite dire in, in some cases. Um, so looking, you know, I'm, I'm sort of reflecting on some of the presentations that we've seen. And I think, Steve, you mentioned something about sort of the, the trusted interactions and trusted interactions across, uh, across the, full, the full spectrum. And really, automotive is maybe one of, the, one of the areas where this becomes very, very critical. Because if you think of someone who has bad intentions, and particularly when we think of someone who has bad intentions that is attacking something as fundamental as logistics or transportation or cars, then you know you think of what are the consequences of, of something something really coming coming in to disrupt that that circle of, of trust in terms of, of data exchange. The other aspect is around connectivity. So I I come from a telco background. Um, telco we've often I think many of us have often heard and potentially used the dumb pipe um, analogy. Um, but actually, I'm going to challenge that a little bit because that dumb pipe is, you know, today we use that for everything. If I use my phone, I would literally not be able, I wouldn't be able to get home. I wouldn't be able to use my car because I have Car, my car key is on my phone. I wouldn't be able to use bank. I wouldn't. I, I literally would just basically sit there and cry, probably. Um, so when we talk about the dumb, you know, the dumb pipe, I, I think we need to sort of elevate that conversation a little bit because actually the telcos have. They they are they are providing something that I think sometimes gets overlooked, and that is trust. It's, it's trust in knowing that when you receive a phone call and mum comes up, you know, that it, you know that it's mum. And in the same way, when you log into your bank, you know that actually it's not being intercepted or you have sort of a level of confidence that it's not being intercepted. So I think some of that sort of that, that dumb pipe um, narrative needs to be a little bit challenged and, and potentially, I think even the telcos have a responsibility to, to sort of highlight some of the work that is done even just through the architecture that, that has been built, the 5G architecture. If you think of the security controls, if you think of, of all of the work that is being done to secure communications, to secure data, to secure data that is being um, that is being uh, collected and analyzed, for example, at the edge, all of those things they are being done securely. And you know, and I'm not saying that there's not more to do. So I'm not I'm not sort of suggesting that we have everything in place. What I'm saying is that the role of the telcos here is really, really fundamental in terms of actually enabling this ecosystem to really work and for people to have, to, to have trust in how it's going to work and in it not being disrupted. 
Um, so here, in, and <clears throat> there's you know a lot of the a lot of the narrative around automotive, and and I was for many years I was on the receiving end of this. Um, it's around coverage expansion. And clearly, you know, we need coverage where we need coverage. And from an automotive perspective, that is often, you know, not, not necessarily there by default. Um, trusted data we've, we've talked about. Collaborative partnerships. So the other, the other um, discussion that we often have is IBM. So I work in telco. We have many other verticals that are, that, you know, operate predominantly in silos um, up until now because generally, you know, banking will not be talking to telecommunications. Automotive won't be talking to telecommunications. But now things are a little bit different because now with telco enabling some of these other industries, we're actually bringing together ecosystems that previously weren't talking to each other. And I think, you know, we discussed 5G ACIA. For automotive, we've got 5GAA that has done, I think, a, a, a really a, a magnificent job at actually bringing together uh, telecommunication and, um, and automotive and to start getting a common language in place. Um, but where are we in terms of bringing together these partnerships? There's still work to do. And, and this is one of the key areas where we believe that actually there needs to be a more, um, a more balanced conversation that looks at, you know, how do we actually bring it together in a way that will be, there needs to be a, a sustainable value chain across the different ecosystems. And that, that hasn't, that conversation, it doesn't always necessarily happen. So often what you will hear is, well, we don't have the right level of coverage. Um, you know, on the other hand, well, there's no business case to provide coverage in certain areas. So how do you break that, that lock? And, and some of it is really, it's collaboration, it's, it's discussion, and it's looking at how we actually build that ecosystem in a way that's going to be sustainable for everybody to be able to actually unlock some of these, uh, some of these opportunities. So um, I'll, I'll skip these because I've sort of talked through. Um, so yeah, so collaboration, it takes an ecosystem, but ultimately it takes a sustainable value chain underpinned by the ecosystem to actually be able to um, to, to unlock the, the potential. Um, so action guide, and this is, uh, all of this you'll be able to find in the report. So if you're interested, I'll, I'll be showing the, the QR code where you can, you can download it. So there, on the, from, a, from a telecommunications perspective, um, you know, what are, what are some of the, the things that we think will help to, um, to unlock this potential? Partnerships, so that dialogue with the automotive manufacturers, with the technology providers, um, the connectivity. So you know, this is this is public network connectivity. It's private network connectivity. It's hybrid. It's a mix of different things that need to come together to provide the right levels of of coverage, the right performance in the levels of coverage. Um, edge. I think the you know there there's a lot of work that's ongoing in terms of edge computing. How does that fit with the requirements of automotive? So if you think of um, when you're driving and you think of the information that is relevant to you as you're driving in a certain area, you can see that there's a lot of data there that will be generated that is only relevant at local. It's only relevant locally. So you don't need to know that there's a traffic jam in LA. You want to know if there's a traffic jam potentially on the M25, and I'm obviously talking for, for those that are in London. Um, so it's about sort of data, so there's the data localization, and, and that really is one of the key 5G, um, sort of 5G edge um, sort of compelling, compelling um, arguments. But it's also around security. It's also around how do you limit the uh, how do you mitigate the risk of that data being 
uh, being intercepted or being compromised or um, being sort of otherwise, otherwise disrupted. Um, participation in standards and regulations, I think there's, you know, there's obviously cross-industry organizations are, are sort of happening. Uh, the discussions with the regulatory bodies, I think that's a really, really critical aspect where the regulators need to take a role in ensuring that the right controls are, are in place. So um, today I saw an article in the Daily Mail, um, and it's an interesting article because it's about security and connected cars, which is not something that you would normally expect to find in the Daily Mail. Um, and the interesting thing is that this means that actually the conversation is coming outside. It's, it's sort of leaving the, the, the um, you know, this isn't a technology, a technology magazine or, or publication. This isn't something that just operators or just um, car manufacturers will be reading. This is, you know, my nan will be reading this and she'll be thinking, oh my God, what, what's going to happen? And I think it's, it's interesting that's come, that it's sort of coming more into the sort of the common consciousness of, of everyday people that are thinking, well, you know, what are the risks? And actually there is a regulation aspect here, which is not about, you know, saying, well, it's, it, it's around how do, how, does, how do you put the right controls in place so that actually my nan can think, well, yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm being protected. I feel like I'm, I'm secure. And, and again, there's a, there's a huge role here for, um, for telcos, for the, for the ecosystem to get together to ensure that those controls are, are put in place at the right points in time. Um, so I've been involved in a lot of work on V2X. Um, there, is, there is a lot of sort of narrative around adoption of V2X. I think there's huge, again, huge potential. Um, how can that be better exploited than it is today? And uh, you know, some of this, again, it goes back to that, to that sustainable supply chain. It goes back to a sustainable supply chain. It goes to um, education, looking at what are, you know, how do you make those, how do you make those use cases tangible? How do you make the value of those use cases tangible? And we've seen some work even here in the UK. I think there's, a, there's been some excellent work done in China. I think China is probably sort of further ahead than, than many of the other geographies in this space. But there's also been some really interesting work done here in the UK where um, you, know, you, you start to see what are the possibilities and you start to educate people that aren't necessarily familiar with the topic how they can make the most of that, that, tech, that, that capability. And, and we did some work with Highways England at the time. We did some work with, um, with uh, West Midlands 5G that I think was hugely valuable in providing them the um, sort of the, I guess the, the knowledge and sort of the um, sort of understanding of what the technology could actually do. So again, it's bringing together that, those, those key stakeholders and making sure that the knowledge is there, that the security controls are there, and that we're bringing a sustainable supply, a sustainable value chain to, to to the um, to the four. How am I doing on time? Perfect. So, okay. So I've talked about governments. I'm not quite sure why I've not really aligned with the slides, but that's that's fine. Um, so this is the. Uh, so just last thing, if that's okay. So this is the QR code for the report. So um, please, if you if you're sort of interested. Um, download and we'd love to to get your feedback one of the things that as IBM we're doing is we are bringing together a lot of these different stakeholders and we are really keen to ensure that actually that potential is realized sooner rather than later so we we'd love to see how we can accelerate realizing the potential of connected cars of smart cities uh, and all of the good things that all of these things can do in a secure and reliable way Thank you very much.
All right, guys, well, thank you very much. Very diverse set of views there and probably a kind of set of requirements. If I could just ask my, pan my uh, presenters to come up stage and have a quick panel. Now, let's try and do something a bit interactive. We do have some roaming mics flying around, so if you've got any questions, then please do put your arm up. I do have a set of questions, so I can bore you with my questions, but please do put the guys on the spot with any questions that you might have. So first of all, thank you very much, guys, for the really fascinating presentations. Um, first question for me is probably for Hakeem. You know, we talked about how can, you know, mobile networks are, are basically already at the heart of a lot of stuff that you guys do. What, but when they go wrong or when something goes wrong around security, you know, what kind of impacts is that, does that have on Airbus and from a perspective of productivity, I guess? <coughs> As I showed in my slides, uh, indeed, um, production line can stop. Um, so basically, loss of productivity, and um, you know somebody is gonna get sacked. <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah. uh, about this, I guess uh, you know you need to understand why it happened. Uh, you know, is there any shadow IT systems uh, in, in in those areas uh, that that you know that brought this uh, service or, or production line disruption? Um, you know, there is uh, investigation work that will happen. Uh, some, some disruptions are shorter than others, um, you know, so, so the importance is also on how quick you can, you know, uh, rebuild your system, uh, restore all, all, all your production line. Um, yeah, a, a lot of attacks are getting more and more complex nowadays. Um, from what I heard, uh, you know, so, some attacks could be hiding other attacks. Uh, you know, so we, we had major attacks where, where you know, the, 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 the hack, uh, hackers come and try to steal your uh, identities or Airbus identities, but at the end of the day, the actual attacks is, is hidden and uh, uh, they, they're trying to reach your uh, intellectual property and your sensitive data. Um, you know that, that that's for the examples, uh, but but the impact clearly is uh, less production, uh, and uh, also faith from investors and, and and things like that. Yeah, and I guess Steve, you know, financial side of things, I guess it's huge, not only corporate but also personal. Yeah, I think the um, the financial aspect of it is is first and foremost in, in most people's minds, you know, from a revenue perspective, but. It's so many people have talked about it already. It's the undermining of trust in the in the ecosystem. So as a as a consumer, as someone who's paying for goods and services, if I'm going to be buying those from a, a merchant, I'm less likely to buy them from someone who's been victim of a cyber attack or a data breach. It's then for us about the reputational harm that that does to potentially to us as Mastercard, but then to the banks that we work with, to the merchants, to the governments, and more. Um, Hakeem just mentioned it there about your investors as well. Investors, shareholders, your board. Ultimately, we're all an we are all answerable to those and we have to be able to give them a warm and fuzzy feeling that we're doing all we can to identify the risk and to be able to mitigate it. But that undermining of trust is, above all, that's, a, that's far greater than the financial impact that these types of events can have. That's cool. And, um uh, Malia, any, any views from you in terms of the impacts? Yeah, uh, one is as financial impact is obvious thing. And in addition to that, I want to add it. Uh, it's not uh, financial impact, it depends on the uh, industries. For example, if you're working on mayor and chemical industries and there is a cyber attack and automated system, then it has significant impact on the human life as well. So there is a life issues and there's V2X is expert tax, so one of the things. So I would like to add on top of that. Yeah, anything for you, Laurie, or I think they guys covered it mainly? I think they, they covered it. I mean, it's everything from, you know, risk to human life to, you know, breach of trust, IP. I think it, it spans mm. across all of these things. Yeah, okay. Maybe a controversial one considering where we are and what we're trying to talk about here, but I guess for Hakim and Steve, you know, where does, when you think about security and solutions, do you, do you necessarily think of an, a telco? to provide your enterprise security stuff? Yeah, I, I mean, worked in security all my life, so yeah, absolutely, we're well aware of the capabilities of telcos, but it's the same 
problem I face as well at MasterCard and, and the way I started my presentation, you wouldn't ordinarily think MasterCard cybersecurity provider, but the same for, for everybody in this room and the, the insight and unique lens that telcos have similarly to MasterCard. So we work with a number of telcos, we utilize some of their technologies and in the, the wonderful world of reciprocity, they use some of ours. So um, yes, aware of those. Again, your mind wouldn't directly go to telco, same as it probably wouldn't go to MasterCard. You'd think your, your big threat intel providers, your IBMs of this world, certainly Microsoft. But um, yeah, you have to be able to leverage the, the, the unique lens that we all offer within this room. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll generalize it more to uh, telco system integrator kind of thing. Um, you know, so some telcos come with the system integrator capabilities and have you know specialized teams for cybersecurity and so forth. But you know, if you say telco, I, I wouldn't think about the, them bringing any cybersecurity solutions today, uh, as it stands. Um, Again, you know, 5G and even any, you know, mobile connectivity system is fairly new to the enterprise. When you think about private networks and things like that, it's still something that even the cyber teams are trying to understand. And things like who is authenticating, uh, you know, is it HSS or is it the SIM card? Is the SIM card enough? Uh, you know, we tend to think that it's not enough. So you need to have a solution that not only provides, you know, the, the, the I would say the built-in uh, uh, protections that come with the technology, but also uh, integrated with all the tools in your network uh, um, for, for, for increased control. Um, you know, uh, to, today when, when I think about solutions that we have with telcos, you know, we have MVNO solutions or IoT solutions, uh, usually we interface our network with the telco, um, but we add some more control on who, you know, who connects. So the telco has to integrate, if I go to technical things, you know, uh, maybe a radius based kind of authentication from the, you know, the telco authenticator towards the Airbus identity or Airbus authenticators. This is the type of things that, that we, we usually implement. Um, Fantastic. And, and Laurie, I guess at IBM, you're kind of straddling a number of different worlds. Do you, do yeah. you see this being an opportunity for the telco industry to play a role? I, I do. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that I think the, you know, the telcos have, uh, you know, we often say, well, you know, what is it that the telco is bringing? And, uh, you know, it's the connectivity, it's the spectrum. But I, I do believe, strongly believe that there is this element of trust and, you know, and we all, you know, we all use it. We maybe don't think about it and we use mm -hmm. it. But I think to the point that Mali was making, um, there is, we need to be looking at, at security holistically. It's not just about the technology. We need to be looking at the people, the processes, and we need to be looking at, at all of these solutions, not just one one component at a time, it needs to be looked at holistically. So there is more that needs to be done uh, when you start putting these use cases and these solutions together to ensure that the uh, that that you know you've got the right security um, elements in in place. That's cool, and I guess you know, uh, Malia, in terms of. Your role, you're, you're with the five, like the five G A C I A. I think I've got that right. Um, you're kind of in both worlds. So, do you see there's a need for a more of industry collaboration in terms of understanding needs and requirements? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, being an operator side and uh, from the five G representing and five G A C I, it's it's one good example. I would like to point it out that. Uh, in Germany itself, but more than 100 uh, partners got the spectrum. So it shows that there is a significant interest from the industries to get telco, into, uh, telco technology into the production line. Of course, there is a still question mark how operator mo uh, monetize these aspects, but uh, this is a different story. But as a technology, the majority of the industries are quite interested. And of course, there is uh, some new challenges are happening. The security is continuous process. We, we learn from our uh, attacks or whatever the issues we come, but we, we're ready to fix that one, but there's a big interest. And I would say that it's not that uh, operators or the ICT world is something different and OT world is something, maybe this is the case, still the 4G was the case, maybe, but from the 5G onwards, there are more integration is necessary 
and the information exchange is, uh, is very important task and the issues they face it and the operators also they are very happy to learn and understand their problem to fix their issues. Okay, any other thoughts on that collaboration piece? Or? Yeah, I, I, I think also a little bit provocative to be, to be fair here, but I think for the telcos what is quite important is also to understand the enterprise requirements. You know, t today we issue RFPs. Uh, in my company, we put a lot of uh, you know cybersecurity requirements. To be to be honest, um, you know, I think it's very important when when the telcos reply, you know, answer that they take this seriously. You know, um, it's it it it's more it's. We, we're not waiting for uh, you know capabilities from a telco. We know what they are capable. Uh, today, they need to carefully read the cyber requirements that we we put there. Fantastic. I guess you know wrapping up then towards the end in terms of you know any any thinking about the future and what we expect to come along. Um, I don't know from a manufacturing point of view, what, what are the kind of big develop, developments you might see coming? Where might there be needs and, and the industry can play a role? And then any final thoughts? Yeah, from, uh, from manufacturer's side, of course, the, as uh, pointed it out, uh, some kind of language barrier is still there. Uh, this need to be fixed. But from the technology side, there are different technologies available, uh, developing uh, GSMA and 3GPP. Uh, it's the only thing is that we need to place this technology into real and see what are the issues they might face uh, from the security side and fix it. And there is, mm, as pointed out, the language issue, the language barriers need to be fixed. This this is a continuous process because so far the telecos are the mindset of uh, different mindset and the different model, uh, different business model, and IT industry, IoT industries have different kind of mindset, different business model. So, of course, these things is started and this need to be fixed. Fantastic. Laurie, over to you. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing the, the evolution of, of cars, um, of, of connected cars, and I expect that you know, the number of connected cars will, will supersede the number of non-connected cars, um, sort of in, you know, depending on geographies in the, in the, near, in the near future. Um, and, and that comes down to sort of the amount of data that, that is being produced and what we're doing with that data. And that is an area where I see huge potential, but also um, a real need to ensure that we are putting the right security controls in place. Because the more data is made available, the more we're acting on that data, uh, we need to know that that you know, the data integrity is there. Uh, we need to know who gets access to that data and who doesn't. Um, and and I, I, again, I, I really feel that the telcos are very well placed to take a role in that um, because effectively they're doing a version of that today, even in the consumer world. So, you know, this is, this goes up in complexity because it's a, it's a sort of multi, multi sort of, there's a, there's a much more complex ecosystem. But I do feel that the telcos are very well placed to to sort of take a role in um, in in um, providing some of those those solutions and and that that trust to to users. Thanks very much. And Steve, any thoughts? Yeah, um, please don't throw things at me. But regulation, uh, um, we've we've firmly moved in, in security into the realms and the, and the the tip of the hat really from the regulators, certainly the the European Commission and ENISA of recognizing how cyber criminals and organized crime groups are operating and they are targeting the, the supply chain. So Digital Operational Resilience Act, even though that's at the financial institutions directly, we as you know, the telco providers, as a, uh, financial services, are those critical service providers that DORA is gonna be focused upon. So we now move firmly from the nice to do firmly into the need to do and the, the mindset, uh, uh, the changing mindset that that brings about for us as security professionals and our ability to influence our board, our investors and our shareholders that we're now, uh, should be seen more of a, as an investment rather than a, a cost code um, is a, a significant shift. Thanks very much. And Hakeem, final thoughts? <laughs> Thank you, GSMA, for making um, telco industry uh, sexy, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's already happening, to be fair. I mean, we, we, we become members of GSMA, you know, uh, in Industrial Forum. Uh, there's 5G ACIA that brings all this uh, collaboration. And then, yes, of course, there is NIS, uh, you know, directives, NIS2 that is, is you know, uh, obliging, I would say, uh, people uh, and companies to, to collaborate and share all the, the you know, the, the type of uh, uh, security uh, issues that, 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 that they will have. So to, to me, we are heading to the right direction um, and let's continue. Fantastic. Well, I think that brings our session to a close. Almost on time, just for lunch. So I think lunch is going to be served outside, so um, please do enjoy that. I think we've got a session afterwards which will continue the story around collaboration where we'll be looking to bring, um, where we've brought together, along with what we call uh, TISAC, uh, a number of other ISACs from different industries to collaborate and start securing um, the risk. So thanks very much. <laughs>